What would it take to convince the world that UFOs, skinwalkers, otherworldly orbs of electricity, and cattle mutilating interdimensional beings are real? That is the question that the National Institute of Discovery Science set out to answer at Skinwalker Ranch. From 1996 to 1998, the NIDS used state-of-the-art equipment to observe the phenomenon that the Shermans had observed on the property. With a rational, skeptical, and scientific eye, the NIDS sought solid and irrefutable evidence of the paranormal. Skinwalker Ranch was happy to oblige. Hello, and welcome to Unknowable, the podcast where we talk about all things mysterious, unusual, or unknowable. I'm Justine. And I'm Gray. Some weeks we break down one larger mystery between the two of us. Other weeks we break down two smaller mysteries on a theme and teach each other about them based on our own independent research. If you want to support the show, find us on Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review, and become a patron on Patreon, please. 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 <laughs> I'm so desperate. Please. Please. Um, so, this is the long-awaited yep. part two. Skinwalker Ranch. Skinwalker Ranch. So last week, we talked about the well, Shermans. Week before last week. Well, last Two episode, weeks ago. Last episode. Last episode. We talked about the Shermans. Yep. This poor family that bought Skinwalker Ranch and <sighs> experienced a whole host of horrifying and interesting paranormal phenomena. Yeah. Ranging from UFOs to poltergeists. Definitely more terrifying, but very interesting, too. Oh, yeah. I'm just glad I didn't have to experience it. Yeah. I still cannot stress how quickly I would have gotten the fuck out of there. <laughs> like, just and some people I know, like, like make pilgrimages and they, like, want to go to yeah. Skinwalker Ranch. Nope. It's not even welcome. No. There's still, I think, a, a very, like, old couple that live there oh. that kind of take care of the property. Yeah. And they've talked about how terrible it is that people still come yeah. because i mean it's worrying if yeah. you're living there and you're kind of elderly yeah and there's people kind of creeping around right they don't know what they're up to no and i mean you assume they're there to find weird stuff but right. maybe they're there to rob you yeah are you going to get murdered by the people creeping around in your yard or the blue orb that's yeah mutilating your cattle you right know what i mean you don't really know yeah so they don't really like it and i mean i've said it before but i would not go to this area. No. Not all set. Anywhere, anywhere near it. I am always like wanting to go to places like this mm -hmm. just because it would be cool to go and See. take a picture but like the best you're going to do when I was Googling to like put photos on Instagram mm -hmm. like a quarter of the photos I found were from one of the barriers yep. to not let you go up the road to Skinwalker Ranch and right. it would be somebody like posing with the barrier like yeah. And right. there's nothing even there that says Skinwalker Ranch or like Sherman Ranch or anything. It's no. just you just know it's going up that dirt road. Right. It's like, cool, guys. Yeah. Not nearly as cool. No. So, yeah. So, the first episode, we kind of talked about their whole experience yep. living on the ranch. And we kind of left it off with them deciding to leave the ranch yep. and selling the ranch. So, now we're going to pick up with who took over the ranch and the subsequent investigation. Because this is where science gets involved. Exactly. Up until now, it's all been kind of like hearsay and secondhand accounting of People who are not trained scientists, they're cattle ranchers. Yep. Which that's not being disparaging in any way. Nope. It's just true that they are not trained in science. Just like I'm not trained in science. Right. Exactly. If I, I said I saw a, a bunch of weird stuff, right. I'm not a scientist. No. Or I'm a doctor. Terrible memory and I'm bad at describing things. <laughs> yeah. and I'm very hyperbolic in my yeah. speech. So also I really want to believe. Exactly. These people didn't want no. to. They no. did not want any part of this. No. Though I thought it was fun to read about how much the patriarch of the family, Tom, yeah. got super into it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't think he enjoyed it. No. I think he just wanted to figure out, like, he was very, I don't even know the right word. He just, he wanted to figure out, like, what is going on. Right. Partly from the standpoint of, we talked about how many of their cattle got oh, yeah. killed. And this was, like, a big deal for them, not only because they prided themselves on how well they took care of their animals. Right. But also that was their source of income. Right. So they were so, like financially devastated yeah. by all of that shit because they had so many cattle mutilations. Yeah. So he wants to know what's going on. And I think it kind of mentioned in the, the book that we um, are going to be getting a lot of our info from, mm -hmm. um, which is called... 
The Hunt for the Skinwalker. Yes. Written by Colm A. Kelleher. And George Knapp. George Knapp. So that's a scientist and a journalist. Yep. Um, the way it kind of described it was, yeah, that he just, he was very stubbornly insistent on, like, I need to know. Right. Like, I'm, I don't understand what's going on. I want to understand it. And he was not a believer in the paranormal before this. No. So very level-headed guy. Yeah. He was converted by the events at Skinwalker Ranch. Oh, yeah. Which I can't yeah. imagine who wouldn't be, honestly. But right. the descriptions of, like, him waiting, you know, in ditches in the mm-hmm. freezing cold just oh, to yeah. get a sight of something or get something on film was it's pretty wild. impressive. Yeah. But yeah, so as the investigation progresses, like, Tom is going to be, like, right there. He doesn't – they him him and the, the Shermans move off of Skinwalker Ranch, but mm. he stays on as, like, a, a – a caretaker for the property. Yeah. So a lot of what's happening here is going to be him sort of still involved, still present, still like on the property every day, but him and his family relocated and bought another ranch. Um, I think it was a couple hundred miles away. Mm. Was, or actually it was 25 miles away. Yeah. I was surprisingly close. Yeah. I was like, hmm, that seems like it's still within range. Just far enough though. Yeah. <laughs> You're not on Skinwalker Ranch anymore. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So yeah, the Shermans were planning to leave. Yeah. As I, again, don't know why it took too that long. Too little, too late. Too little, too late. <clears throat> so they were already planning to sell, but before they really had a chance to get into that process, they were offered a buy from a man named Robert Bigelow. Yes. He is a millionaire businessman. Mm-hmm. Um, I won't say he's known for this because who would know the name of this guy, but right. he made his fortune in the Budget Suites of America hotel chain. Right. He's a believer in UFOs, and he was the founder of the scientific group that's going to be stationed at Skinwalker Ranch, um, the National Institute for Discovery Science, which we'll refer to as NIDS. NIDS. Which I don't like, but no, there it is. Um, so apparently Bigelow's grandparents first saw a UFO in the 40s while driving across the Nevada desert. And so he kind of became fascinated by the paranormal all throughout his childhood into his later life, um, he spent time interviewing people who said that they had seen UFOs, and he kind of dug into a lot of government information. Right. Um, yeah, he's a he's like a, a millionaire believer, which yeah. is an interesting combination. Which is an awesome combination. He has, like, insane amounts of resources yeah. and, like, a really strong belief in the paranormal. Which is, I just wish there were more of right. him. Right. Um, yeah, he, he did a rare interview with uh, Wired magazine, and said, quote, I have an enormous amount of data from a lot of different sources that give me some pretty strong convictions about the authenticity of the existence of anomalous phenomena such as UFOs. Which also intrigues me, too, because, again, being as rich as he is and as powerful as he potentially is, like, not for his particular claim to fame or whatever, but right. from just money in general, mm-hmm. you got to figure there's probably stuff he knows that oh, he yeah. maybe can't even reveal how he knows it or who told him. Right. But I'm sure he has heard some things Mm -hmm. that most of us will never hear. Oh, yeah. And it's just strengthened his conviction. Right. And Robert Bigelow, like, in in modern day, he owns Bigelow Aerospace. Yeah. Which is a contractor for NASA. Yeah. They had a contract with NASA where they were going to send up this inflatable module for the uh, International Space Station. Like, it's this, this Kevlar balloon basically that would go up and it was all folded up and once it got into space it would inflate huh. um and so he had they had a contract with nasa where they were going to shoot it up there and they were going to attach it to the international space station damn so he's like legitimately a space pioneer space like, nerd space nerd like he's like he's kind of like <laughs> elon musk where like he's not a governmental agency sending stuff into space he's a private citizen who's building space faring technology yeah so he's he not like he's he's not just like some some guy like in his basement wearing a tinfoil hat. Like he's no. got money, resources, and like drive to like get yeah. shit done. Which is awesome. Which is awesome. So he he's the one who ends up purchasing Skinwalker Ranch or Yeah. Through the NIDS, the NIDS he purchases Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah. Yeah. Supposedly for only two hundred thousand dollars. <throat> um, Seems very cheap. Yeah. So he kind of um so, yeah, about NIDS. So, this is the first scientific organization created and funded to bring scientific rigor to paranormal research. Um, started by Bigelow. Kind of designed to remedy the issue of mainstream science's attempts to study paranormal activity being grossly underfunded. Right. Which, yeah, obviously. Like, that's the, like, why isn't there more of this? Why isn't there just, like... I don't know. Like, 
scientific organizations that study paranormal things. Yeah, there's very, very few. Right. And I don't know. It adds to the suspicion for me, Mm -hmm. I think, in a way, that you'd (laughs) think if this was a thing... Oh, there's some things like that where it's like sometimes something is so quickly written off that you have to wonder, like, why is that? Right. Like, if, if there's a chance this could be real, mm-hmm. and if, again, like any rational person, even not with a super scientific mind, right. could imagine, like, we cannot be the only living creatures in oh, the yeah. galaxy. Definitely not. In all of space. Then we have to think there are some other beings. Right. And we also cannot assume that, like, a... A race as backwards and behind as we are are the most intelligent in the whole... Oh, God, no. The whole of everything. Right. Like, that would just... It's too egotistical to even think that we would be the the most advanced. Nobody else can possibly have more technology than us. Right. Or intelligence. Like, that's just insane. Like, we have people in our culture that can't even grasp, like, that there's more than two genders. Yeah. So how can there not be people in the universe that are smarter than us? To quote Insane Clown Posse... (laughs) Magnets, how do they work? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we haven't the insane clown posse that people actually legitimately like. Right. There's definitely being smarter than us out there. I have to hope so. So, yeah, so there were um, two PhD educated scientists as well as a world class multidisciplinary advisory board that had been handpicked by Bigelow. Right. To, so, yeah, bring like the, expertise in so- technology. Right. The, to the weird. They would kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna keep jumping. <laughs> um, so like, so like, like the, the general structures. Like you had like investigators, and you had like the advisory board. Mm. So the investigators yep. would be out in the field collecting data, trying to take photos, video, and stuff. Yep. And if they got anything of note, they would send that to the advisory board, who would independently verify if they had something. Yeah. If that was paranormal or if they could explain it by other means. Yep. So it's kind of this like like two step authentication process that really makes it like if they were to find anything, would make it that much more legit because exactly. there's this independence and there's, like, you know, separation of investigators and analyzers. Yeah. Uh, analysts. Analysts, yes. <laughs> analyzers. Yeah. <sighs> Analyzing people. <clears throat> well, and it was, yeah, they, so the, yeah, the investigators spent hundreds of nights on the ranch. Mm-hmm. They were not there 100% of the time. Right. Because they would go back and forth between the ranch and they had sort of a base in like Las Vegas. Right. So they would kind of jump back and forth. They had a private jet. They had a private jet. Which, yeah, at one point in the book he mentions like most groups like this don't even have the money to rent a car for the weekend. (laughs) And we've got a jet. Like there was some instance where Tom called him and he was like on a jet within an hour and a half to head over there. From getting the phone call to getting to the ranch, it was like five hours. Yeah. It was insane. It's like... That's pretty cool. That's Again, pretty cool. that's what money can get you. Exactly. Which is important. Um, so, yeah. So, there's these scientists. They they hired several, like, outside people occasionally to come in for various things. Um, and then there was one of only two journalists allowed on the team to be there and witness things was a man named George Knapp. Um, so, he was, again, co-author of this book mm-hmm. that we got a lot of info from. Yep. Um, He was a very serious journalist, but he kind of dove into the paranormal at the risk of his own career, which sounds dramatic, but that's true for any journalist. Oh, yeah. Or any scientist, even. Any person. Yeah, any person. Um, He basically believes that there are very few journalists in the world willing to look behind the curtain of tabloid sensationalism and overblown fiction at the risk of their own careers to find out if there's actually any truth to the stories of UFOs or life outside of our understanding. Um. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, his one quote about this was, I officially went crazy in 1989. That's when I produced a multi-part television series, news series about UFOs and the mysterious military base the world now knows as Area 51. The viewing public ate it up, but my fellow journalists were not pleased. Wow. Um, but he said that observing the NID study, quote, shook him to his core and that he will, quote, never look at the world the same way again. Jeez. That's a pretty big deal. That's wild, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so they basically... Like you said, the family moved to a small ranch 25 miles away and basically were like, we don't care if we ever come back here again. Right. Except for Tom. Tom's like, Who was like, actually. So, and the book mentioned too that he was, Tom was a very proud man. Right. Which we kind of talked about and that he was really angry essentially at like this stuff is happening that he doesn't understand or comprehend. Right. And it forced him off of this property that I think, you know, they all moved on to there hoping... This was going to be, like, a nice, fresh start. It was, like, their dream property. Yeah. 
it sounds like every time they describe it, it's like gorgeous. Oh yeah. And just pastoral and beautiful. And they had kind of, you know, hoped to be successful in their industry. And then right. this shit happens. Um, so I think he really wanted to stay there and kind of be part of this investigation to find out like what the hell's going on. Um, but yeah, his family was suffering. They were scared. They weren't sleeping. They were being ridiculed by the community who were, you know, at, at that point had found out about a lot of what was going on. Right. So they were not happy about that. So yeah, Tom stays on as the NIDS ranch manager. Right. Which is brave. Yeah, that's wild. So he was still like on the ranch like every day. He would commute 25 miles to the ranch every day. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, he would join them on stakeouts. Um, and so NIDS purchased a few dozen calves. And Tom had a few more on the property that they basically used as bait. Yeah. Which is sad. It's There's a lot of, like, mutilation in this story, and it makes me really sad. Yeah, yeah. If you're not a fan of animals being, I guess, yeah, there's maybe less than there was in the first part, but there's still some oh, yeah. some mutilation. It's so. just, I just feel so bad for the cows, because they, they don't know. They're just, they don't know. They're just chilling. They're just yeah. living their life. Just hanging out. And then all of a sudden, like, wild interdimensional bullshit. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Just takes like over ripping them apart yeah uh. <sighs> yeah no they um they arrived in September 1996 and Tom took them on a tour yep and he showed them a couple carcasses of some mm-hmm. cows that had gone missing from his neighbor's property and wound up in quote unlikely positions under the barbed wire fencing between the two houses yeah which even like the veterinarian that was with Nid said that that was really odd right that they would there didn't seem to be much sign of, like, struggle, so it's not like they got caught in the fence, because they would have seen some type of wound. I mean, from a barbed wire fence, oh, yeah. you'd have scratches, and it would be obvious. Oh, yeah. But it just seemed like they had just happened to die right there. Right. And, like, their their carcasses weren't decaying at the rate that they should be, given, like, the yeah. hot Utah sun. hmm So it was just, like, so almost like they were, like, sterilized. Yeah, exactly. They, um, yeah, he showed them two more that had been mutilated. So I think, yeah, the ones that were under the fence were just dead under the fence for who knows what reason. And then these other two mutilated with their rear ends removed, which is a weird theme for whatever beings are doing this. Yes. I still don't really know why Mm -hmm. they would want these cows' butts. Mm -hmm. Scoop out their (laughs) intestines. Yeah. But they are into that. Um, But yeah, he, the veterinarian and, well, Tom said that in the kind of heat they'd been having, a dead animal would be bones within weeks. But with these particular cows, it had taken almost a year Jeez. for them to get to that point. Um, and the veterinarian suggested that perhaps a chemical had killed off the putrefying bacteria. Right. Which is an interesting theory. Right. Like the, the sort of like medical, the medical aspect to it, it just seems like it's very much like purposeful. Yeah. It's not just like random chaotic animal ripping into a carcass or no. like bacteria eating away at something. It's like something's been taken very carefully medically dissected and then sterilized in the process and then just dumped. Yeah. Well, they mm-hmm. had said that in the first part, we talked about them finding those calves in the corral, I think. Mm-hmm. And they mentioned there being like an odd chemical smell Yeah, that they couldn't pinpoint. Right. And that, that, yeah, that'll come up again too with like, yeah, this weird combination of like this violence with like this tediousness. Mm-hmm. Of yeah. these animals being like brutally killed, but right. like sanitized or neatly carved into or whatever. It's right. not very obviously not a predator doing this. Yeah. Which is terrifying. Or not a not a traditional like earthly predator. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It is a predator of some kind. Yes. Um yeah, he showed them some of these like odd holes that he had been finding in the ground. Oh yeah. Um, like a foot deep and several feet in diameter said that he would find these on the property pretty often, particularly after seeing nights of lights in the sky. Right. Which is interesting. Um, they estimated that like two or 300 pounds of soil would have had to be removed from the holes. Right. But he would never find any soil nearby. Right. Which is like, stuff like that is so creepy. Right. It shouldn't be creepy. It shouldn't be creepy. There's it's like just a, a hole. random hole being dug. Well, and he, he described them as like, with like really smooth sides as if a cookie cutter had just like... Yeah chunked down into the ground and pulled up some ground. Exactly. But, like, where did the dirt go? Right. And, I like, mean, at the point he was showing them, they, like, had eroded a little bit so they didn't look as clean. But he said, right. yeah, when he would find them, they'd be super clean cut. Yeah. Which, 
Which to me that. sounds almost like a soil sample. Yeah. You're taking a very large yeah. soil sample. Yeah, because the thing, I think the, the most common theme probably from all of these weird things, like all the mutilations, these weird holes, like anything like this, is that there's never, not only are there never tracks right. from people or animals, but there's never, like, a couple times they mentioned, you know, oh, the ground was really dry, but even a dry ground isn't going to hide vehicle tracks. Exactly. Which seems to be the only thing. I mean, a lot of this stuff happened while he's around the property. Right. So he would have probably heard or seen a vehicle, but definitely they would have needed to do that. I mean, what animal, like, you can't even chalk that up to, like, oh, an animal dug it. Like, well, then there'd be dirt right next to it. Right. They're well, not I would have smooth sides. Fucking like eating that. the dirt. Right. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> this is great. There's a whole um, herd of animals that come over and, like, yeah. Neatly cut a hole and just eat all that dirt and leave. Yeah. You know, it's, <laughs> several hundred pounds of dirt. Yeah, several hundred pounds of dirt. So this is bizarre. So that's just one of those. Yeah, which does sound like a soil sample. Ugh. Right, like a giant, a giant soil sample. Yeah, which it does. Like really, that that's the other theme of all of this is that it feels like whatever is plaguing this area is not doing it. I mean, definitely doing it a little bit to like fuck with them. I think right in a strange way, but I think that's part of their whatever these beings are, like their research, mm -hmm. in a sense, like seeing how people react. Research is a good word for it. Yeah. Like the, um, when Ellen Gorman saw that, like, that trailer outside of her kitchen window that was yep. like, had somebody sitting at a desk. Yep. And like got up and stared at her. Like, <clears throat> there's like, it's like science, it's like interdimensional scientists mm -hmm. are like observing and like taking samples from these cows and taking samples from the dirt and... There's these all seem very like scientific and like medical experiments. Yeah, it's which is super bizarre. It's still creepy. Oh yeah, it's still so creepy. Yeah, so they wanted essentially the idea of the team of Nids being on this property was to again take this very scientific approach. They wanted to not only witness the events, but hopefully to get some type of readings of some kind. Yes, whether it's photos or videos or. Magnetic readings, radiation readings. They wanted to get some type of thing that they could have proof of weirdness. Um, so basically the team was kind of split. Um, half of them thought it would be best to essentially just load up the property with like tons of equipment. Yeah. As much as they could so they could record everything. And then the other half thought it would be better to kind of less is more, right. which is what Tom thought. Right. Um, he thought too much technology would drive the unusual forces into hiding. That they should set up a camp nearby, off the property, and kind of sneak in at night so they weren't really disturbing stuff. Right. Which, again, he's got reason to have a strong say in this because he lived there mm -hmm. for, you know, it was like a year and a half they were there. Right. And he personally spent a lot of time trying to catch this stuff. Yeah. And, like, we talked about that one um, instance where he was watching that, like, that triangular craft yes. hovering and, like... He literally, what he, do we say, like... He, he, like, cracked his knuckles or yeah, something? Yeah, some, like, tiny, tiny, like, sound that there's no way any, again, like, any normal human thing could have heard that from that distance. Right. Immediately, like, stopped what it was doing yeah. and shut off his light and left. Right. So he's got a good point in clearly these things do want to observe and do want to, like interact with things on the ranch, but once people start to become too aware, I think they kind of get like, eh, right. and freak out. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. He said, this phenomenon needs to be hunted like a wild animal, maybe even a very smart big game animal. And then they kind of read about um, the UFO sightings at Gulf Breeze in Florida, mm -hmm. which was basically like all these sightings were happening and then they stopped once instrumentation was brought in to record them. Yeah. So, which I know... Skeptics will say, what a coincidence. Right. They tried to record it. It didn't work. But it seems to make sense that if it was beings right. from somewhere else. Oh, yeah. That wanted to observe us but didn't want to be yeah. found out, that they wouldn't want to be recorded. They don't want to be figured out or right. located or analyzed. Counter surveilled. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, which that'll come up a little later, too. Oh, yeah. Um. So yeah, this was, I think, the thing I was thinking of, that he told them about how he had learned to capture video footage of the flying lights. He would use, like, the oldest manual video camera he could find yep. and make his way slowly, sometimes crawling on his stomach, to, a, like, this good vantage point that he had. 
It was maybe two thirds of a mile away and would sometimes take him hours to reach it. Jesus, man. Because he would be crawling on his stomach and taking care, like, not to break any sticks or branches again, not to make any noise at all. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he'd pause for up to 20 minutes if he thought that he, like, if he broke a branch by accident. He would just lay as still as he could, barely breathing. Either Tom is insane. <laughs> yeah. Or this is a very delicate situation that you have to yeah. treat like a big game animal that you're trying to hunt. I think it's a little of both. Probably a little bit of both. I, like, if I wasn't so scared of this kind of stuff, yeah. which, as fascinated as I am, I am scared of it. Oh, I'm terrified. Like, I... I could see doing that because you'd be so determined, like, especially seeing as much as they did. Mm -hmm. I would imagine it'd be, like, infuriating. Oh, yeah. The people in their community, I think, I'm surprised they got as much ridicule as they did only because they talked about, in the book, how many other people in that whole area had seen weird things. So this wasn't just limited to their no. property at all. This was the whole area. Right. Um, but I could see that you would really want some type of, like, see, like, this is happening. Yes. This is proof. And him using the oldest manual video camera that he could find mm -hmm. is interesting because he wanted, like, he noticed that, like, anything that was, like, too digital or too much technology would fail right at, like, the last moment yeah. when he was trying to actually capture something. And it's almost like it was whatever this phenomenon is able to, like, interfere with something that's digital. But if it's a manual like a camera with actual film in it, it's way less likely to fail because it's just the mechanical motion of like the yeah. the mirror or whatever, the lens opening. So it's there's less that can go wrong. Exactly. Which is interesting. Yeah. No, they they know. Yes, yeah, so they set up a trailer, an observation trailer. And yeah, initially it was basically just a physicist, a veterinarian, and then George Knapp, a yep. journalist. Um and then they, yeah, they would hire a few external investigators. And so each night that they were there, they would usually send out two teams, um, at least one scientist and then other investigators would go and basically do independent, like, night watches. Their general goal was, like, not really to communicate unless something happened. Right. So it's not like they were influencing each other, I guess. Right. To be like, oh, like, I have a weird feeling because that can easily be like, oh, well, yeah, I guess I have a weird feeling too. Exactly. They're kind of doing their own thing unless they saw something crazy. Um, and then, like you said, they had a 15-member advisory board who would have, like, these intense two-day briefings by the scientific field staff. So they were, like, regularly back and forth and communicating and mm -hmm. sharing info. Um, so yeah, it was only a few days after they got there, September 16th, they had moved into the observation trailer for the night and someone saw some odd lights moving in the sky on the west side of the property. Um, they said it wasn't that much. It was like 10 minutes worth. And then they kind of dipped out of sight and then rose up again. But it made them excited. They said it was like a morale booster right. to see like, oh, cool. Especially that early on to be like, sweet stuff is happening. My dog is boofing. Boof. So that was a good start. Um, yeah. And so they, yeah, they started interviewing people in the area through like October and November um, they talked about, you know, more missing cows, more mutilated animals. Um, a lot oh, of mutilated cows. The cow with the broken legs was a good one. Oh, yeah. That, that was, was really good. Locked. <laughs> like, wait a second. Yeah, this, this guy they talked to, one of the neighbors, and neighbor is, I think, I have to keep reminding myself, like, living in a regular like portland maine neighborhood right that neighbors there were like not nearly as close as they are here but this was a neighbor of the shermans that basically had a he found one of his cows outside of the fenced in area where all the other were, others were and there was no broken fence line right so this cow had not like busted through the fence right it was just gone yes so it was laying on its back yep its legs were broken, like, outwards, Ugh. like, so, and its its chest was ripped open, so its um, ribs were, like, were, like, pulled out and opened up, like, so it's like you, it's like you cracked this calf open. Yeah. And its legs were bent at odd angles. Um, he said, my immediate impression was that an enormous force had ripped the animal apart. Ugh. One of the leg bones was laying 10 feet away, having been yanked free of the knee joint. 
Even with a young calf, the brute force necessary to rip a femur off a knee joint and snap a tendon suggested something very powerful. That's terrible. That's awful. Yeah. Like, I can only imagine what that would look like, too. So that was actually, that was a different one because that was in March and that was on the ranch. Right. This was one of Tom's cows. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wait. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm. Oh, no. Oh, God, we're disorganized. Jesus. Yeah. Okay, so before that happened, another, so this was, yeah, a little earlier on, like in October, um, one of the neighbors had found a cow outside of the fence line. He went and checked it out. Two of the cow's legs were broken. So he's like, what the heck? Like, but that can happen from time to time, like whatever. So he goes in to get a blanket to cover her up. He comes back like five minutes later and she was gone. Oh, right. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So he is like, what the hell? Like, where could she, with two broken legs, like how... Could she have gone far enough for me not to, like, see her immediately? So about an hour later, like, he goes inside. He's like, okay, well, I guess. He looks out the window and sees the cow about 50 yards from where he had originally found her. He goes to check it out, and now all four legs were broken. And oddly enough, like, his first theory was that she had twice been lifted into some type of aircraft. And then when she was dropped back into the field is when her legs were broken two at a time. Which is terrible. That poor calf. Yeah, I know. It just... That's rough. I mean, I'm assuming, I don't know, but I'm assuming he probably had to put that calf down. Mm-hmm. Because what are you going to do with four broken legs? Yeah, God. So, and his family had also told of, like, these strange Mexican hat-shaped objects that they had seen, which were, again, one of the odd shapes of UFOs that people in the area had seen. Yeah. Which were referred to as Mexican hat-shaped because they were kind of, like, long, but then they would have, like, this rounded part on top. Yeah. So... Yeah. Like a classic UFO. Yeah, pretty much. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, God. So that... A violence against animals. Terrible. Yeah. They had other instances of, like, seeing lights um, in November. Then, yeah, it was like, things were basically chill through December. They were in, like, this deep freeze. Tom basically told them not to come back until, like, March. Because he was like, nothing's going on. It's freezing cold. Like, you guys don't need to be here for this. Um, but it was January 1997 that... He called them saying that he had found three calves in the corral near the observation trailer during, like, an intense snowstorm. Temperatures were, like, 30 below. Yeah. And three of these cows had injuries to their ears and eyes, specifically circular holes in the eyelids. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And their ears were cut up as if with pinking shears. Yeah. Messed up. And, yeah, the veterinarian came and agreed that, like, no predator would do that. No predator is going to go out in a snowstorm in weather that cold right. and go into a corral and attack some calves. No. And That's just poke, not normal. Poke holes in their eyelids. Yeah. And then like slice up their ears. Yeah. And then just Walk peace away. out. Yeah. So Ugh. yeah, there was an older vet that was like, oh, it was just a coyote. But Tom, again, being someone who's lived on farms and has done this for many, many years, like thought mm-hmm. that that was laughable. Yeah. It's like, there's no way. So <laughs> great. Um, and then it was February, later February, that he brought his cattle back onto the ranch. Um, I'm assuming because, like, maybe the weather was starting to get a little better. Right. And he said that kind of triggered an avalanche of weird activity. Yeah. Which started in March with what you were talking about. Yes, okay. Tom calls them close to babbling about how they got a newborn calf. Oh. Meaning the forces. Yes. Which is the... So, yeah, this this was the instance where... George Knapp and the team got on a private jet yeah. within an hour and a half, got there in a matter of hours. Um, yeah, leg bones ripped away. And they, yeah, they noted how neat and fastidious the scene was. Yep. Again, this combination of this enormous force to, like, rip this animal apart. Right. And yet, um, he kind of described it as, like, a rag doll being laid out. Yeah. Like, this was not... I don't know, like, you can almost think of a, a big wild animal killing something and, like, ripping the legs off and, like, tossing them, you know? Right. Kind of carelessly as it was attacking, I yeah, guess. Right. But this was this was clearly, like, these limbs were set, you know, kind of equidistant away from the body. Right. Um, like, posed almost. Exactly. Yeah, like, this was laid out for them to find. Yeah. And there was no smell. I mean, this cow yeah. hadn't been dead for long, but still. Right. It was ripped open. Um, the inside of the animal, they said, looked pink and healthy, almost unnaturally clean. Yeah. With internal organs all missing and no blood. 
Not a single drop of blood. Not on the grass, not on the hide. What the hell? Bear in mind this poor calf is laying on its back. Yeah. Ribs cracked open, pointed yeah. up at the sky, leg ripped off, like all all torn to pieces, but yep. no blood. No blood. Doesn't make sense at all. Like, no sense at all. No. Again, if if all you can chalk this stuff up to, which does make sense in the setting that they're in, where there are wild animals, it of course makes sense that your first thought, if somebody said like, oh, my calf got killed, yeah. your first thought would be some type of animal got onto the farm oh, yeah. and killed that calf. But right. there's no animal that yeah. can just suction out all that stuff yeah. and leave no trace of no blood, blood and like clean out the insides right? and then just be like, bye. Um, yeah. And Tom said that the entire dismemberment, I'm assuming because he must have seen the calf previously or been in the area, this was like 40 minutes or less. Yeah. That this happened. So again, the time frame of this stuff is so unusual that you know he, it's not like yeah. he's catching this in the act, right? Or that it's hours or days or whatever. This is like right. under an hour. That's insane. Like it's not like somebody like say it was like some weird fucked up humans who were doing this. Yeah, they're not going to get in and out, like do that to a calf and then get out in under an hour. Like that's just not going to happen. No, no way. <laughs> and there had been one of their dogs, a blue healer, had been the one to tip Tom off that something was even happening because I guess the dog was, like, growling and looking off towards that area. Mm -hmm. um, that dog just took off towards the west. And at the point that the team was there, it was, like, six hours later, the dog hadn't shown back up. Yeah. Um, they looked at the body. Um, the vet discovered soon after that the calf's ear had been removed all the way to the skull. Yep. And it was, yeah, what looked to be a knife or a scalpel. And that same ear was the one that had a plastic yellow, like, identifying tag on it. Yep. Which is interesting. That's not a coincidence. Not a coincidence. Um, and, yeah, their other three dogs hadn't even left their kennel all day, even for food and water, which was very odd for them. These are right. dogs that are used to roaming and... Like, fighting coyotes and, yeah, like... chasing like off defending. animals. Yeah, like, they're... They were like, nope. Yeah, fuck that. And the blue healer that took off never came back. Yeah. That dog was just gone. Oh. Yet another dog victim. Violence against animals. Damn it. Fuck Skinwalker Ranch. <laughs> fuck this place. So, yeah, a couple days later, they were, like, talking about the case in the trailer. Um, the dogs at this point were out of the kennels, but they were still, like, sticking close to the people because they were obviously... I mean, having a dog, you having dogs, mm -hmm. you can tell when a dog is not comfortable. Oh, yeah. When a dog is scared... I'm not sure. I mean, I've seen Moo Cow scared of, like, thunderstorms, but oh. never seen her, like, truly scared. Terrified, like, an existential dread from yeah. interdimensional whatever. Like, they know stuff is going on. Yeah. Um, But they said it seemed obvious that something was still lurking, which is a, also a common thread in this. Yeah. There's a lot of feeling of, like, dread and oppression mm -hmm. on this ranch. Oh, yeah. Um, Shortly after 11, the dogs start howling and barking and freaking out. Yeah. So the team goes to Tom's truck, which he had like a crazy powerful spotlight that he would use to go out to, I didn't really know this was a thing, to like go survey the cows. Like he'd yeah. go drive around and like use that to be like, okay, I can see all the cows. He seems like he's kind of obsessed. <laughs> he's, a little, cows. he's a little intense. Um, so they said all the cows seemed to be huddled in the north part of the pasture, but it looked like there was one single calf like kind of on the South side, all by itself, hidden in a shadow. Huh. So they go to check it out. They're like, okay. They see two yellow orbs. And as they got closer, it was obvious that they were the eyes of a large animal. Ugh. 20 feet off the ground, perched in the tree, quote, almost casually. Ugh. Why? Why? <laughs> Just why? So Tom gets his gun, of yep. course. Classic Tom. <laughs> Classic Tom. And he fires, and the orbs instantly disappeared. So they go to the tree. They find nothing. They searched, Tom yells, I see him, and then two more shots go out. And he says, I got him at point blank. Yep. And they still find nothing. Tom estimated this creature was like 400 pounds. Jesus. No blood, no tracks, except a single obvious oval imprint in the snow with two sharp claws protruding from the rear. They said it looked like a huge bird of prey print. A raptor. What the hell, man? Right, like what do you mean? 400 even is pound that? bird of prey? Right. That's not cool. With and glowing orange eyes or yeah like yellow eyes. and got shot several times at point blank it said that tom was convinced that there were two yeah there was one in the tree and then another one and that he shot both of them yeah. point blank and nothing and well one was like he, he described it as like a 400 pound wild dog looking looking thing yeah so it's like what kind of animal looks like a wild dog but leaves prints like a 
a raptor. Right. And yeah, so like was the raptor thing in the tree and the wild dog was on the ground? Like was the wild dog in the tree? Right. Was the wild dog in the tree? How else is that footprint on the ground? Exactly. Terrible. Yeah, they only found two single oval imprints, not even close to each other. The other one was like 20 feet away and nothing else. And there was, it seems like there was some snow on the ground, but not, it wasn't completely snowy. Right. So, but still, you would think yeah. there if would it, be something. If it left two footprints, why didn't it lo- leave more? Right. Why didn't it actually leave, like, a path? Um, but again, this is the theme of most of these encounters is that there was no proof gleaned from this. Right. They saw it. I think it was helpful for the team to see, like, okay, there's really weird stuff happening something here. something going on here. But they didn't, weren't able to capture anything. They didn't have any good prints to go off. There was nothing. Right. Um. So yeah, things kind of chilled out for a short little bit. Yep. I guess not really that long. No. R- the rest of March yeah. into the beginning of April. Um, and then Tom basically told the team that like things didn't feel right. He described it as a feeling of oppression, as if someone was watching him, and he said it often preceded unusual events, which is also terrible. Yeah. Like, a, you just know some shit's going to go down. <laughs> yeah, he and just knows. Does. And it does. And this is clearly like a thing that happens. And he's, like, become accustomed to it. Like, right. oh, there's that feeling again. Here we go. Some shit's about to go down. <clears throat> um, so April 2nd, he reports another calf has gone missing. The fifth that year. Jesus. Only and April 2nd. It's April, yeah. Um, as well as one of his long-term ranch dogs. So the team gets there the next day, and they just missed another weird event. Yeah, this is the cattle, right? Or the... The bulls. The bulls, yeah. yeah. So... Oh, yeah. Ellen was even there. Yep. She had not been there since they left in August, 96. So she's back and probably regretted it immediately because then this happens. Yep. Um, so they were making a trek down to the west end of the ranch. Again, like a routine mission. They were just making sure all the animals were cool. Surveying the animals. I'd really like to know how many animals they had because it seems like there was a lot. Yeah. Like there had to be a lot. Well, they had like 400 acres. Yeah. There was tons. Um. They pass the bull enclosure. They've got four bulls. Yep. Apparently, like, very beautiful, majestic bulls. Seminole and Black Angus. Yeah. Cemental. Yeah. Cemental? Cemental, sure. Cemental and Black Angus bulls. We're definitely farmers. Yes. Definitely. Such farmers. Yeah. We have lots of bulls. (laughs) Know all about them. So, they were really proud of these bulls. Each of them weighed more than 2,000 pounds. They're big boys. Big boys. (laughs) And... It says that Ellen said out loud wistfully that she would lose her mind if any of them went missing. This is important. They're very, very into their bulls. They're very into their bulls. But it's, it's very relevant that she said that. Right. And then... It's prophetic. It is prophetic. And it's, like, prophetic and also, to me, said that, like, maybe these forces really are truly listening. listening. Mm-hmm. And... Again, maybe not doing things purely just to mess with them, but doing things specifically to see, like, how will they react. Right. Because then they continue their, you know, their routine. 45 minutes later, they're heading back, and then Ellen screams and points out the windshield. The bull corral is empty. Mm-hmm. And they're like, what the hell? Like, again, they were just there. It's like 40 minutes. Yeah, 40 minutes. Um, Tom goes to search around. So there's the corral... I'm picturing them, you know, being, like, outside, I'm guessing, Yeah. if they were able to see them as they drove by in the truck. And all there is is a small white trailer on the west end of the corral. There's no entrance from the enclosure except a small white door that was locked. Yeah. I think later they even described it as, like, being locked with, like, a piece of wood yeah. or something. Or like, like a piece of barbed wire. Yeah. It was, like, stuck in the, the lock. So, like, the way I've, – I've actually seen a picture of it. Oh, cool. So, it's, like, a white trailer – and then, like, the trailer is, like, part of the enclosure. Mm. Like, the fence loops around, like, from one edge of the trailer to the other edge of the trailer. Okay. So, and then it's just got, like, a small little, like, human-sized door. Oh, my God. That's locked. So, it's and not even, like, a like a garage door type of thing. It's just, no. like, a Well, if you think about door. it, like, if you think of, like, a trailer, like, had, like, the, the garage kind of looking door on the, on the like, the short sides oh, of the trailer okay. so yeah. the long the broad side of the trailer is what's facing the enclosure oh, Jesus. so you wouldn't be able to get to the front doors from the enclosure right okay so so yeah that's the only entrance from the enclosure right and so he goes to search around and he peeks inside the trailer right and there's the bulls all 
What is it, four of them? Four bulls. All four bulls are packed into this tiny packed. little trailer. He says they seem to be barely conscious, yep. and they're just staring hypnotically. He bangs on the door, and it seems to break their spell, and they start freaking out. Destroy the trailer. They trash the thing. Just, like, think of, like, bulls in a tra- china shop. But exactly. Bulls in a tiny trailer. Bulls in a tiny trailer that probably they, like, shouldn't have even been able to fit into. No. Um... And yeah, they start freaking out. One of them busts the door open and they stampede out. And it, it says it took them hours to get them back into the corral because they right. were like losing their minds. Right. Um, they even, when they investigated the area later, they noticed the one entrance, again, the entrance the bulls couldn't even fit through anyways, right. um, was locked shut, had undisturbed cobwebs on the inside of the door. Yep. And I like, again, there's no way. No. I mean, the size of these bulls, there's no way that an animal did that. No. A, because, like, how? Why? How? Why? How? Yeah, like, there's just no, there's no way the bulls did that themselves right. if they freaked out that much getting out of that thing. Mm-hmm. Again, I'm not a, a farmer. I'm not <laughs> experienced with giant animals, but I've seen and read things just taught, like, animals like that don't like to be crammed into a small space. Like, it takes no. some effort to get them oh, yeah. to do that if you needed them to, like, and you wouldn't do that. But, you know, getting, like, a horse into a trailer, like, it takes some coaxing to be like, let's go. Right. They're not just like, okay, cool. Sweet. I want to squeeze into this thing. Plus, they had, they had no access to do that. Right. There's and no like, way. Maybe if, like, Tom, because like, they were, like, familiar with Tom, maybe that would have been, like, one thing. But, like, if some, if we're operating on the assumption that some stranger came onto their property to, like, fuck with them mm. and, like, I'm just going to get these giant, like, several hundred pound bulls into this trailer, like, as yeah. a joke, real quick in 45 minutes before 45 they come minutes. back. Yeah, it's going to be hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, just, there's no way. No. So, yeah, they kind of checked the area and found that the metal bars near the enclosure, or of the enclosure w- near the trailer, were highly magnetized. Yep. The ones on the opposite mm. side were not. And, like, two days later, the magnetic field was barely detectable. Right. So, so shortly after this event, everything was all the Whatever did magnetized. this, like, magnetized the bars, which then faded, which then goes to show that it wasn't just, like... For some reason, there's, like, a high magnetic field in this area or, yeah. like, these bars were magnetic for some reason. It's, like, whatever the magnetization happened was connected to the event with the bulls. Yeah. It's that's funny. that's one of the events that spooks me the most, I think. Yeah. Like, just how bizarre that would be. Right. Again, right after she said something about them being missing. And so mm-hmm. it was, like, yeah, the forces, like, heard that. And they didn't go all the way. They didn't kill the bulls yep. or do anything like that. Because, again, I don't think that they're killing anybody for the sake of killing them. I right. think it's a necessary side effect of them t- taking these bizarre samples. Right. But I don't think they're killing for the sake of it. No. Or to hurt anybody or, like, to mess with their livelihood. They're just, it's like, oops, that's just, you know, what we got to do. Right. Necessary byproduct. Science. So, but it was like they heard that and they were like, let's make them think yeah. the bulls are gone. Right. Like, they're never going to find them in this trailer. Right. And there they went. <laughs> um. Yeah. So, shortly after this. Tom and Ellen are checking on the animals again. They see one of the cows wandering towards, like, a blue salt lick that, I don't know, for some reason I'm imagining it hanging. Yeah. I don't know why. I think so. Um, And they said the cow suddenly just stops dead in its tracks and, like, lowers its head kind of scared and, like, hesitant. Right. And starts backing away and then, like, turns tail and just stampedes away. And the herd of cattle that was nearby, like, split in half. Some going west and some going east. As if something invisible was splitting it. Yes. Tom gets out his compass, which he has learned over this time, can sometimes detect weird things. Yeah. And he saw the needle pointed right at whatever it seemed like this force was. So again, another common thread of like weird magnetism happening. Right. Which is so like, again, Tom like picks up these weird, creepy little tips. Yeah. He's like, like, dude, pull out your compass. Got my compass right here. Yeah. Um... Oh, so that yeah. freaked me out. Yeah. Like, you, all of a sudden, you, like, your compass just, like, points, like, really strong at whatever's, like, causing them to split. Right. Yeah. Like, right where these cows are splitting off. Like, obviously, like, something is... I don't know. Yeah, I was picturing there being something, like, moving in between the group of them. Mm-hmm. And them all just being, like, shit. Right. And running. Oh. It's Terrible. Cows, man. Terrible. Um, so, yeah, the group spends... They, are, like, map the magnetic forces around the ranch. Um, they start getting... Like, some plaster casts of these weird tracks that Tom had found. Like, these perfectly round tracks. Right. That seemed like they were more from, like, a mechanical object. Right. 
Almost like something like kind of like landed. Yeah. For a second. That was a thought that I had. Right. It was like a craft landing. Yeah. Ugh. Like perfectly round. Ugh. And so while they're doing this, they're quartering the ground and they are overwhelmed by a powerful musk. Yes. This is also a little bit of a theme. Um, yeah, they couldn't find anything. They talked with one of the investigators they had with them helping that day, and he was in a different area, didn't know that they had experienced this, and described the same thing, where he just kind of felt like he was being watched, felt right. a little weird, smelled this really strong smell. Yeah. Nothing. Like, they had the feeling that something was camouflaged nearby. Yeah. That is a terrible feeling. It's horrifying. I You're can't being even imagine. watched by something that's both... Like, invisible and or camouflaged, yeah. but also has this, like, really strong, musty smell. Right. That you're just like, oh, <clears throat> cool. Like you'd think if it could, like, camouflage itself, like, visually, why can't it camouflage its scent? Maybe right. whatever species or whatever type of creature this was doesn't have organs that detect smell. Yeah. Just like how there could be animals that have organs that detect aspects to the world that we don't have right. like infrared light or whatever it makes me kind of sad to think that this poor thing is out there like not even knowing that it reeks Reaking. like ass <laughs> it doesn't even know it's like oh uh, but yeah they Tom said that that smell was associated with whatever this weirdness was he uh, was familiar with the smell uh, um, this smell during their investigation would reappear sometimes without warning sometimes even in the control center uh, just yeah. Which, yeah, nope. just no. I would not be anywhere near this place. <laughs> nope. Um, so the dogs keep being weird. They're, like, on edge. Um, on April 7th, they get a call from a neighbor who's, like, there's some UFOs coming your way. They looked out. They didn't see anything. Right. But that was kind of, you know, again, like, an encouragement, I think. Yeah. Of, like, weird stuff is happening nearby. Mm -hmm. It's picking up. It's picking up. Um, they, a couple days later, there's, like, a huge downpour. Um... They're all out around midnight. Like, I do kind of feel bad for this team sometimes. They're, like, out in the middle of the night. It's down On, like, hundreds of nights. Just, yeah, like, in this shitty weather. Um, so they spot, George Knapp spots, like, this dim light to the south, despite the fact that, like, they were saying they couldn't see anything. There's, right. like, no visibility at all. Um, they go to higher ground, like, uh, on this ridge, and they kind of see, like, this kind of large bright light like a dirty yellow light they said hmm. and then they kind of map that location for later so that's you know kind of like one of the hot spot areas I guess right. of just weird stuff but that never really panned out to anything um, a couple days later Tom and Ellen are there at the control center The one of the team members turns the portable electromagnetic field detector on and the needle goes crazy centered on Ellen on Ellen and they had like a they had like since they were in like like their control center they had like recorded like like the the magnetic baseline of the room so they mm -hmm. knew that there wasn't any like spike due to like electronics or anything exactly it was Ellen it was Ellen and she walked out and the reading went away and then she walked back in and the reading came right back up yep it was like attached to her yeah it was maybe, attached to maybe her maybe it's been Ellen this whole time yeah maybe she's she is the phenomenon right wow and they're like looking for her they're like where the hell did she go so. Yeah, that's a little odd. And again, like, yet another thing where it's like, that's not proof of anything. No. It's just... Weird. Yet another, like, in a long, long string of, like, oh, yeah, that's bizarre. Right. But not anything. Um, so, yeah, by the end of April, they're, like, six months in, and they're kind of thinking, like, maybe we're not going to find any proof. Right. Um, in May, they had these enclosures built for the dogs. Because they called the dogs biosensors. Yes, biosensors. Exactly. They, I mean, again, dogs are known for this in general, right. to be very aware of things that we can't sense. Right. So they had these wire enclosures that kind of had like a wooden viewing platform. They said yeah. it was like a deer hunting stand. Um, and the enclosures, like dozens of times, were messed with yeah. by they don't know who or what. It's like poltergeist-like activity. Yeah. Open the doors, padlocks would vanish, the dogs would get out. Um, and they said, like, it would have taken a ton of effort for this to be humans doing this. Oh, yeah. The <laughs> number of times this was happening and the persistence with which this was happening, right. it just wasn't. I mean, like, everything at Skinwalker Ranch. Like, it would take so much. Yeah. For somebody to be doing this. Like, exactly. why would they be? Yeah, this happened all month. The dogs got all jumpy again. 
Um, and yeah, they were doing night watches to try to catch whoever was doing this. And they never saw anybody. Right. So just, you know, one of those things. It's like, you're messing with me, man. Um, so yeah, then early June, they are out chilling with a couple dogs for biosensors. Biosensors. They had their night vision binoculars, which are apparently super sweet. Yeah. Um, and they see a silent blue light. They said about the size of a basketball. Yep. Like swaying. The dogs noticed this, yeah, this light is like 15 feet off the ground, maybe. They said they could even see the grass lit up underneath it. Right. So they're not just like hallucinating and it's not just like a reflection. It's like. Yeah. There's a light source. Something making light. Um, And they said it was really bizarre. Like it was as if a blanket of silence descended. They didn't hear any noises of anything. Freaky. And right as some of, one of them got their camera on it, it disappeared. Of course. Damn it. Um, ooh, this was the the good finish <laughs> of the story, though. The good stuff, yeah. <laughs> this is the good stuff. So they kind of go back to where it had they had seen it, and one of the investigators has his night vision on the tree line. Yep. What does he say? A, there's a huge black thing in the trees just in front of us, and it's moving north. It's moving north. It was silhouetted against the, the sky, so it was fucking huge. Yeah, they like, said he said it, like, blocked out the stars. Yeah, that's... Which is freaky. Messed up. Yeah. I don't want to think about how tall that is. No. Um, he said, it is big and I'm not sure if the trees behind it are trees. It's blocking out the stars. It's still moving. Then all of a sudden he yells, it's got me. It's saying, we are watching you. Yeah. Then there was silence. That's terrible. It's terrible. It's really but, terrible. But like, it wasn't like he, like nothing was saying this to him. It was yeah telepathically communicating to him, we are watching you. Exactly. Yeah, he said it it took control of his mind, which is so much worse. Like I said, I I really, reading that initially, my thought was that it had said it to him. Yeah. Which didn't really make sense, knowing that he wasn't, like, right up against it. But still, just my logical brain. Right. It's like, oh, it just told him. Right. And then no. No. Either way, it's free. Yeah, you get, like, telepathically communicated to him to say, we are watching you. So it has an understanding of the human language enough. Yeah. To say we are watching you, and it's like felt the need to communicate that. Yeah, which again you could take as like threatening, mm-hmm. but also that could just be them just like, dude, we're just watching, right? We're just hanging out. I mean, that's really. Mo- I mean, aside again from cattle mutilations, and they did incinerate those dogs that one time. Yeah, <clears throat> but aside from that, right? Who knows what happened to some of those animals that disappeared? Right. Some cattle and some dogs that disappeared. We don't know. They might be living happy lives now. Maybe a bit. Probably not. Probably not. They probably got experimented on. But I see what you I see what you're trying to go with. Though, yeah. Is that it's not necessarily a malevolent force. Exactly. Like, like there's, maybe. Like the dude who heard it's got me, he was shook. Oh yeah, he like, was not he happy. Was, uh, like a <laughs> shell of a person after that. Yeah. Which I don't blame him. No. Sir. Do not blame you if you're listening to this. Right. Um, yeah, so they kind of spend a lot more time in that area, July and August. Um, they see a lot of like lights. That kind of appear, they would disappear, reappear in other areas. Again, they're playing with them. Mm-hmm. It's like this example is like literally, you know, you're looking at a field and you see a light over to your left and then it's gone. Right. Right as you're about to capture it and then all of a sudden, 30 yards away, there it is again. Right. Like there's a lot of that happening. Um, so then end of August, 97, cattle are all skittish, 4 p.m., that day, they get all spooked and they start stampeding yep. to the south. They break the fence line. So Tom's, like, getting on his horse. Classic Tom. And he's worried. They broke into the neighbor's alfalfa field. Apparently, I guess maybe at that stage of the alfalfa growing, the cows will want to eat it. Yep. Something about it will, like, swell up in their stomach. Yeah. And they can die from bloat. Right. Not good. So he's just trying to save his cattle again. Again, like, he's not even Classic worried. Classic Tom, just trying to, like... Yeah. Save his cattle. Like, Those are my babies. So he hurries back. He gets his son Tad. Classic unfortunate Tad. name. Classic Tad. Um, and Tom notices that the animals seemed scared to go back to the ranch. Like they were stampeding away from the ranch. Yes. Not towards something else. Um they spent a couple hours like getting them back. But then like once they'd get them back, something would happen, they'd get spooked again and they'd run south. Right. So they're like, God damn it. And this is like forever, because this was four PM. This started, and this is now, like, midnight. Yeah. Tom's pissed. Oh, you just, like, want to go home and like, eat dinner. Yeah. And, like... You're just stuck out there. Like, you can't just leave your cows... Right. ...in the neighbor's field or whatever. Right. So you're just like, F, the, like, fence line's broken. Right. So you're just screwed. So instead of taking them straight north this time, 
he tries to take them a little east and then north at a different point to try to, like, if there's a certain spot. Trying to go they, around it. Which is weird in itself. <laughs> yeah, but, but of course, like, Tom is just, like, used to it yeah, at this point. Like, like, all right, I'll just, go, I'll just go around whatever's Damn. there. Yeah, like, whatever invisible thing you guys are scared of. Um, so this new path takes them, like, within 50 yards of a creek that's, like, below a drop. So he rides towards the creek. This golf ball-sized blood-red light just comes into view. Right. All of a sudden, it, like, just barely misses the horse's head as it flies past him. The horse rears up, starts to run. Tom has to calm her down. The cattle are freaking out. One of his prize bulls was chasing his tail and freaking out with fear. Right. Losing his mind. Tom saw, like, the ball darting around the bull's head. Yeah. So. It's just fucking with the bulls. Yeah, it's messing with him. Another red ball comes at the horse. And then this time, Tom loses control. The horse takes off towards a canyon. Tom, like, throws himself off the horse, like, ten yards before the horse plunged over the edge. Thankfully, it only landed, like, 20 feet below and was basically fine and made its way back up. But that horse was just, like, chill to just run over a, the yeah, edge of a canyon. Like it, would, it, would, it would rather run into a ditch than yeah. a canyon. A canyon. Rather than be chased by whatever was chasing it. Yeah, it was totally fine to just be like, bye. So Tom notices... One of those blood red lights is like herding the cattle towards the creek. Right. For some purpose. Right. Tom and Tad try to get in the way to help, and but like the cows just start toppling over the edge. Ugh. Which is really sad. These Apparently, poor cows, none of them died. Right. I guess, but like some of them got trampled because they were just falling over the edge. Yeah, into like this canyon. Just terrible. Um. So yeah, he goes back to the creek and you know checking it out, seeing how many of them are injured. And this is, like, past two in the morning. It's, like, poor, poor dude. Um, So he's, like, I think back at the house, or back where Ellen is anyways. They see Tad coming back from the creek, and they see the orb hovering above him. Yeah. He doesn't even notice. Right. Like, oblivious. Ellen screams, and then the orb comes towards them. Like, close to the ground. Passes a few, they were in the truck. Passes a few feet over the truck, and then just flies off. Yep. What the hell, man? And Ted hadn't noticed, but after they told him about it, he said that he had the feeling of being watched just before his mom screamed. Yeah. So whatever that orb was, he was, like, aware of it, but he wasn't. Yeah. It's freaky. He didn't know. It's being observed. Yeah. So who knows what the orb was trying to do in that case. Right. That does sound, like, that's the first thing that sounds a little malevolent. Yeah. Like, what else are you doing trying to get them down to the creek? Right. Like, over an embankment. But. Are they just trying to see, like, how... Tom and Tad react to stress? Is it, is right. it, are they testing, like, the humans, maybe? Yeah. Like, creating this really chaotic situation and seeing if they can, like, handle it? Right. Or okay. how they handle it? It doesn't seem... I mean, they definitely are experimenting on the animals, but it doesn't seem like they're necessarily getting reactions from the animals, right. per se, but the animals are, like, tools to mess with the humans. Right. Yeah. So that was messed up. Um. So, yeah, they basically... Kind of, not really a whole lot happens after that. That was, what did I say that was? Uh, August. August, yeah. So, there was another instance where they, like, saw another light. Kind of a, oh, wait a minute. This was a good one. The Okay, so the couple of the team members are chilling on the edge of a bluff. Right? Yep. There's some animals nearby hanging out. Yep. There's a couple other colleagues nearby. They were out there for, like, six hours, like, two in the morning. Jeez. They were about to move to a different part of the ranch, and they're packing up their stuff. And then one of them sees a very faint light, about 150 feet below them. And he watches it, kind of puzzled. Like, it seemed really faint, so he, like, thought maybe it was a reflection or something. Yeah. Nudges one of the other dudes, and they see it getting bigger. So now they get binoculars out, they set up a tripod, and now it's, like, six inches. This was also... Just to back up a little bit, this was after one of the researchers had sat down to start meditating. Oh, that's right. Yes. Because he, they noticed that when you sat down and started to meditate, it would kind of activate things. Yes. So if somebody sat down to meditate while he's meditating, they noticed this faint yellow light. On Which is below. a little flashback to the first part. Yes. That dude that came onto the ranch, that and, stranger who came onto the ranch to yeah. meditate. And that thing, like, ran up on him. Yeah. And, like, scared Super pissed him. at him. Yeah. Yeah. Scared him, like, beyond belief. Yeah. Yeah, so this dude is meditating, trying to coax yeah. something, and then they were, like, essentially, it seems like they were like, this isn't working. Right. Let's go somewhere else. Packing up, and then boom. 
They see this faint yellow light. Yep. It's getting bigger. Now, like, getting to be, like, a foot wide. Getting brighter. And then one of them said, it's a tunnel, not just a light. Yes. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, something's in the tunnel. Uh, which, so, we, we've already experienced so tunnels upset. on Skinwalker Ranch, but it was yes. the, the tunnel in the sky. Yes. Where the black triangles flew out of it. Exactly. So it's like almost like a portal to somewhere. To somewhere. So this tunnel or opens up from again. From somewhere. From somewhere to <laughs> somewhere. And so it opens up again. Yep. And this poor guy is just watching like through the binoculars. So there's like two right. of them there. One of them doesn't have binoculars. One of them does. So the guy in the binoculars is just like essentially like narrating to the other guy like yeah. what he's seeing. And he's like, there's a, there's a black creature coming out. I see his head. It has no face. Oh my God. It just climbed out. It's on the ground. Oh my God, it walked away. He even described it as using its elbows to climb through the tunnel and out. So it's like an actual creature. Like yeah. it's, a, it's a corporeal something. Exactly. That has climbed out of a tunnel. Yeah, he described it as like at least six feet tall and like 400 pounds. And basically once it was out of there, the light starts to decrease in size and intensity and disappeared. So it's like he... You know, tunnel opens up. Yep. Weird, faceless creature crawls out, and yep. then tunnel closes back up, and they're like, "Okay, Great. now whatever that thing is is out here with us." Yeah. And the other dude who couldn't see it, like, told the guy, "Like, all I saw was a light." Right. Like he did not see this tunnel. He didn't see the creature. Right. Yeah. They went down to like check it out. They did smell a strong sulfur laden odor, which is interesting. Which is very interesting. Sulfur is connected to like demons and like. Yeah. The traditional Christian idea of, like, hell. Not a good thing. So maybe, I don't if know. weird stuff's happening and you're smelling sulfur. Yeah. Get the fuck out of wherever you are. Yeah, just go. But they didn't find anything. No radiation. Uh, no magnetic spikes. They kind of looked around for, like, a half an hour. They thankfully didn't hear any, you know, noises that indicated that that creature was still nearby. Right. Um, and really all they got, like, even despite the one guy taking photos, was one faint, blurry photo on an entire roll of film. Yeah. The other photos just didn't come out at all. Right. So, nothing. Nothing. So, yeah, they get to the end of the summer. The NIDS team is kind of bummed because they're like, we've seen a bunch of stuff. We've got no proof. Right. Um, they said the events seemed almost designed to evade capture. Yeah. It's like um, just enough for you to observe it in person. But yeah. But not enough to actually give you proof that you could explain it to anybody. Exactly. So they're probably getting increasingly frustrated because it's not like they're there and nothing's happening. Right. They're there and weird stuff is happening. Wild shit. Quite a bit. Yeah. But there's just no whatever. Um, so they pick another spot nearby-ish to have like a second location. So they're kind of doing that as well. Um, but yeah, by the end of July 97, they've got like no scientifically useful data. Um. So they install surveillance cameras. Yep. They're like, okay, fine. Like, this isn't working to get proof. Right. Stuff's happening, which is great, but we're not capturing anything. This is a solid idea. Yeah, this is solid. So they put six cameras up, an area about 600 feet from the control center. Location chosen because this is where a lot of weird stuff has happened. Right. Um, that brutal mutilation of that calf mm -hmm. happened right by there. Uh, six cattle had disappeared from there. They had seen blue orbs and orange portals. So this was like... Hot spot. A hot spot. Um, so yeah, these cameras are going nonstop, all day, every day. Yep. And a year passed yeah. with nothing. Which, bear, bear in mind, this isn't like being backed up on like a digital hard drive. Right. This is like VHS tapes. Yeah. So they have a year's worth of VHS tapes. <laughs> of 24 hours a day. Yeah. Yeah. Um... But then, yeah, so that, that was end of July 97. So July 20th, 98, Tom notices that three of the cameras have stopped recording. Yes. He's like, what the hell, man? Weird. He, of course, thinks it's lightning. Yep. Why would you? Just, dude. Well, because, like, the the the, um, the video cameras are on, like, the top of a telephone pole, essentially, mm. in, like, a, a circular pattern so that they're basically recording 365 degrees around. 360. <laughs> oh. 365 days. 365 See, we're going days. with that. For, th for 365 days, it was yes. recording 360 degrees around. It's, it's true. It's accurate. I'm more thinking that, like, at that point, I would just assume it was something bizarre. Oh, yeah. Though it's been a year of nothing, really. Yeah. So he's like, okay. Maybe it's maybe things like are lightning. Normal. No. Classic normal. Tom trying to, like, think it's not. <laughs> trying to be logical. Wild. Yeah. But it is wild. <clears throat> um, But, yeah, he calls the team. 
and says that someone had vandalized the cameras. Right. Which is technically accurate. Yeah. Somebody or something vandalized something them. vandalized them. Um, the cameras were examined, and it was obvious that somebody really wanted to stop them from working. Yes. They were, yeah, on a telephone pole, 15 feet off the ground. The wiring was mounted to PVC tubing and then covered in duct tape. Yeah. Each each individual wire was wrapped in duct tape, and then they were yeah. duct taped to the PVC pipe. Exactly. So this is, like, pretty intensive. And again, these have been out for a year. Yes. They mentioned in the book something I wouldn't even thought of, that, like, duct tape sitting in, like, the hot sun. Oh, yeah. And all kinds of the elements for yeah. a year. Just gets, like, like welded yeah. to it's the... Yeah, just glue. Yeah. Um, each set of wiring from individual cameras had been se- yeah, separately wrapped... Um, and yes, yeah, so they go to check it out. The tubing, PVC tubing was all bent and twisted at the bottom of the pole. Yeah. The duct tape had been unwound from the individual wiring and the pole. And then the wiring had been dragged from each of the cameras. Yes. The tape itself was gone. Yep. The duct tape. They right. looked all around. That would have been like a decent sized ball of duct tape. Yeah. If you like ripped all that off. And it was just gone. And again... If, I mean, we're assuming, I guess, in this case that it's humans doing right. this, not animals. Right. But, like, why take the tape? Um, so they wanted to see, like, did these cameras go off at the same time? Like, what was the deal? Yeah. And to see, also, if these cameras had gotten footage of these vandals. Right. So they could figure out who did it. Um, the three cameras lost power almost simultaneously. Yep. At 8.30 p.m. the previous night. Right. Seems impressive enough as it is. Right. That means whatever did that ripped the wiring out of all of them at the same time. Right. At right. least I'm assuming. Or they disabled them in some other way. Right. Um, so yeah, this was just before it got dark, so there should have been enough light to capture them. They realized that one of the cameras that still worked right. was pointed right at that pole. Exactly. So they're like, sweet. And yeah, the timestamp went past 8.30 and nothing. Nothing. They could see the cattle just hanging out. Um, they took the tapes back to Vegas to hope that they could like digitally enhance them, but nothing. They could actually see in the enhancement the tiny red lights on the bottom of each camera lose power at exactly 8.30. Right. But there was no clue as to what had done that. Right. So, to recap, something... So, at 8.30, the cameras stop working. Yeah, all three. And yet, instantaneously, the wires were pulled out of the cameras. Each individual wire, which was wrapped in duct tape, was meticulously unwrapped in duct tape and then the pvc tubing was bent and like thrown on the ground yeah all without being captured on camera right so we have to assume that something made the cameras lose power before all that happened right which is weird enough anyways like what nobody was on that pole nobody was within view right so that was just a thing yeah so, like, so, what the fuck even is that? What, I don't even know. That's, I think that's, like, the most... Yeah, the most bizarre, just... And to me, it's, like, why just those three? Like, right. there's three other cameras. Right. Why not all six cameras? Right. But just those three. Mm-hmm. Like, again, almost, like, as if it was to mess with them. Right. So that, that they could see the footage from the other cameras and yeah. have no explanation as to how it happened. Right. Like, that was intentional. Yeah. Because there's no way... Even if it was vandals, like, which it... I'm just going to say it wasn't. There's just no way... But even if no. it was, like, why why just three out of the six? Right. Makes no sense. It doesn't. So, yeah, great times. So, yeah, and then there's really nothing until uh, April 99. Yep. Oh, yeah. They, this freaked me out, too. Yeah, this was bizarre. Um, I think both Tom and Ellen saw, like, these clouds of dust coming from one of the corrals where there were some horses. They noticed, like, there's something in there with the horses. Go to check it out. And they see, like, this reddish-brown blur running right. around. Right. Tom assumes it's one of the dogs. and he's like, Or a dog. Yeah. And he's pissed. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> Again, like, he's like, oh, it's just a dog. Yeah, it's gotta be. Totally. But no. Heavily muscled. Yep. Gross. Everything's always heavily muscled. Everything's muscled. With short legs. They said it was like a hyena's body yep. with a bushy tail like an exaggerated foxtail. Yep. Um, it was obviously hunting the horses, but... Obviously didn't intend to really hurt them because it didn't. Yeah. It, like, nipped at their legs. Um, but, yeah. So, it was, like, moved like a hyena with a head resembling a dog with short legs like a boar and, like, 200 pounds. Like, nothing they'd ever seen. No. Again, living like in areas like this. Out there. No. 
And basically the animal like sees Tom get out of the truck and then just takes off. Yeah, like easily hops over the fence. Yeah. And then just like runs away. Books it. Tom goes to catch it. Just at least to see where it went. And this is like wide open ground and he can't see anything. Just gone. Vanished. Totally disappeared. And then he got the smell of wet fur. Yeah. Like a wet dog, which is just like that sketchy wolf they saw. Yeah, like that musky. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Both. It's like the weird musky scent and the same like wet dog scent of that huge freaking yeah, wolf they saw. Bulletproof wolf, yeah. Yeah. Bulletproof wolf. Yeah. Yeah. So basically that was like the last bizarre thing yeah. that happened there. They, uh, Tom had talked about, though, um, of seeing, like, strange animals on the ranch, oh, yeah. too, at, at various points. Yep. Um, saw some tiny bright red birds that had suddenly appeared for a few days, um, and then they just vanished. Never they saw said, them yeah, like, looked like tropical birds. Yeah. That they shouldn't have been on the, the property, and then they no. were just gone. Um, he saw huge spiders that he had seen around the abandoned homestead, and then they were just gone. Yep. Um, and... Yeah, just like bizarre, weird creatures that are almost normal enough to where you could just write them off. But then when you really think about it, you're like, wait, yeah. why did I see those giant spiders by this and then they're just gone? Right. Or like, why is there tropical birds flying in like the Utah desert? Exactly. And then they're just gone. Yeah. And that was, that's the theme of like a lot of it. Like the same thing with the wolf. Like they yeah. had seen that wolf for several weeks. Right. And then it just never showed up again. Just gone. And it's like almost just normal enough. It's like it's a giant wolf. Right. But. But. Is Something's it, just off it about right? it. Yeah. Yeah. So they really got no solid evidence. Right. Um, yeah. Beginning in 99, that's when these other two people started living there. Um, they had instructions to like report any weird things to the teams. But they, I think they reported a few weird things, but then it kind of just dwindled down to nothing. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, they kind of thought that maybe the NIDS team was never able to be as stealthy as Tom was. Yeah. So the idea was like, did this force just like lose interest in them? Was there not like the emotion switched? Like there was right. this really strong emotion with Tom and his family. Right. They were scared and stressed and mm-hmm. really curious, but like in a fearful way. Right. And then now this team was like eager and curious. Was that like a turnoff I for wonder, these creatures? I wonder too if it's like, so imagine if you were a scientist trying to observe a clean sample of some sort of animal. Yeah. But then imagine you have, you know, you have like the the pure sample, which would be like the Shermans, but, but then you replace the Shermans with like animals that are scientists that are <laughs> observing you back right. and are trying to like record what you're doing while you're trying to record what they're doing. Exactly. I could see how that would be like not... Not the science experiment that you're trying to conduct on Skinwalker yeah. Ranch. It's like a fascinating way to look at it. Like, yeah, they were really curious to study this family. Like, it, and it's pure. Yeah. Like, unobserved, or like, it's 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 pure environment. Yeah. Like, the, a human in its natural habitat. Exactly. Not, yeah. yeah, not trying to look at you. I mean, Tom was kind of trying to check them out, but maybe they didn't realize. Yeah. All that he was doing. Or, like, that's, like, part of what makes a human human. But, like, he wasn't, like, a trained scientist right. dispassionately trying to, like, document it. He was, like, a human reacting in a very human way. Yeah. Yeah. So it, like, tainted the subject. Right. They were, like, ugh. They, like, tried for a while and they're, like, this isn't any use. Right. So, like, they, <laughs> the interdimensional scientists didn't get any good evidence and, like, the humans didn't get any good evidence. So yeah. everybody's just, like, ah, screw it. Yeah. They all just left and they're, like, whatever. So, yeah, that was kind of the end of it. They, um, NIDS disbanded in 2004. Um, yeah, like, activity on the property kind of stopped basically, like, by 2002. Yeah. And, like, that's been it. Um, so in 2007, um, the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program was, this was a secret investigatory effort funded by the U.S. Defense Department. To study unidentified flying objects, primarily on Skinwalker Ranch, um, they spent like two twenty two million on the program, which was run by Luis Elizondo, who we talked about in the astronauts episode. He was yeah, like a former Defense Department dude who had worked on this project, who left oh, because yes, 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 they were not taking a lot of the evidence they were getting seriously enough. Right. He felt that they were just like brushing stuff off, and I he was like, that. "Come on." Um, so yeah, t- there's still parts of that study that remain classified to this day. Wow. Um, and then yeah, Bigelow in 2008, 
Bigelow Advanced Aerospace Space Studies. Um, the archived versions of the webpage say it focuses on the identification, evaluation, and acquisition of novel and emerging future technologies worldwide as they specifically relate to spacecraft. Right. Dude. It's legit. Cool. <laughs> legit. He works with NASA. Yeah, he got involved with the Mutual UFO Network. Move, Move on. on. <laughs> A nonprofit that collects and investigates user submitted reports of UFOs. Um <laughs> Yeah, the MUFON's executive director, Jan Harzen, recalls Bigelow saying, quote, if we were able to fund you so you could put investigators on the ground faster, could you get better data on some of these reports? Um, sadly, he was only involved with that group for like a year oh. at the most. Um, and then in 2012, the Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies Program lost its funding from the Department of Defense, yep. which is sad. Um, as the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program contract expired and was not renewed, I guess, though, there are people from both that group and Bigelow's Paranormal Enterprise that have launched um, a for-profit company to the Stars Academy of Arts and Science, which I think I also mentioned in the Astronauts episode, Yeah, launched in 2017 to research and reverse engineer UFOs, among other goals. Wow. So Bigelow's not involved in that, but it's just some of the people that were involved in his thing right. and the other thing kind of got together. Um, so in the meantime, the ranch apparently was sold yep. for a, now this is unsubstantiated. Right. Basically all of this except for the fact that it was sold. Right. For a rumored four and a half million dollars. So Bigelow really made out. They spent yeah. two hundred thousand to buy the ranch and sold it for four million. Yeah. I mean who knows how much they spent doing the investigating, but I can't imagine it matched that. Right. Um this was in twenty sixteen to a corporation called Adamantium Holdings, which is a shell corporation of unknown origins. So some people theorize that Bigelow himself is the owner of Adamantium, which I don't really know why he'd want to distance himself necessarily. Hmm. Um, but yeah, after the property was bought, the public road that had gone through or to the property was closed and is now guarded, apparently because, supposedly because of the frequency of the trespassers, but again, people theorize. It's a convenient cover. Exactly. Like it's bought by this shell company. Nobody knows what's who's behind it or why they want it or what they're doing. Clearly, they're doing something. Right. You must with spend it. $4 million on a property. Yeah. That has this kind of history. And so, like, no nothing, has, like, it's 2019 and nothing has been done. Right. So if you wanted to think, like, oh, maybe it's, like, some type of property management or some type of, like, real estate right. company and they bought it to, like, parcel it up and build stuff, like, why aren't they right. doing that? I mean, I know that takes time, but it's been three years and there's nothing. Yeah. The homestead's still there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if the people who had lived there starting in 99 were still there. Right. Or not, if they're, like, still maybe, like, ranch managers, yeah, like, caretakers like Tom was. But, hmm. yeah, it seems very sketchy. Yeah. But nobody really knows what's going on there. Or, so, yeah, like, what this company is. We just got to keep our eyes out. Yeah. In the coming years to see if Skinwalker Ranch comes up in any strange ways. Yeah. I'm super curious. But, yeah, you can't get anywhere close to it now. Yeah. Which, yeah, to me is interesting. I mean, yeah, you can, it's really convenient to say, yeah. oh, well, there's people living here. They don't want to be disturbed. You know, this is private property, all that stuff. But for that to coincide with this odd, mysterious shell company buying it right. for a lot of money. A lot of money. And then just shutting the place down and, like, nobody can come near here seems right. weird to me. Again, it furthers the idea to me that there is something going on. There's definitely something going on at Skinwalker Ranch. Oh, yeah. So, like, like these last two episodes, we've basically just gone over, like, all the facts of what's been going on. Mm. Like... There's just, like, a, an overwhelming amount of just, like, data. Like, yeah. eyewitness accounts, like, like corroborated not even just, like, by a family that you could say was, like, under duress and, like, made not, not made things up, but, like, exaggerated stuff. Yeah. But then you have, like, scientists, like, physicists, veterinarians. Journalists. Journalists. Like, yeah. people who are trained observers who are observing unexplainable phenomena. Yeah. Not necessarily paranormal, I guess, but something is going on at Skinwalker Ranch. Oh, yeah. There's something out of the ordinary. Yeah. I haven't experienced any of the things that I've heard about in Skinwalker Ranch, and I, no. hope, I hope I never do. I really hope I never do. But, like, the fact that, like, so many people have experienced them at Skinwalker Ranch means that there's something happening. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, we will save our theories yes. for part three coming in a couple weeks. Yep. But, yeah, for now, that wraps up part that's, two. That's, that's the story of Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah. Those are 
the facts. Those are the reports. Those are the good chunk of that book, yep. basically, or right. the info. Um, so, yeah, we will talk more about what we think is going on. Which, so yeah. some good stuff. I'm excited stuff. for that episode. Yeah. So if you have any ideas of what you think is going on, let us know. You us. may have figured out by now we are moving to a bi-weekly release format. Schedule. Yes. Yeah. We're deciding, yeah, every two weeks we're going to release. So that gives us a little more time to do research yep. and get things set up. We're both pretty busy people. We pulled off the one once a week thing for a while. We did. It was a good 24 episodes yeah. every single week. It was tense. Yeah. So now, yeah, every two weeks I think is going to be good. Mm-hmm. So this gives you guys more time to listen. Give us your theories. But yeah, right. let us know what you think of Skinwalker Ranch. Skinwalker Ranch Part 2. Yeah, Part 2. Next week, Skinwalker Ranch Part, part three. 3. Final part. It's going to be intense. Then we can move on from Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah. Which is a little sad. It is honestly. sad. But this is going to, we're going to reference Skinwalker Ranch a ton. Oh, yeah. It'll be good that you have this nice base yeah. to know what's going on. It's foundational. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. So that was episode 26? 25 or 26. Oh, man, I never know. Shoot. I should really know. Either way, part yeah. two of Skinwalker Ranch. This has on. been unknowable. Love you.